adventure camp come on kill your friends that camp is worth all their deathly ends i don't know (laughs) welcome back to funeral krt the podcast where we take a look at the best and worst of obscure media and it is officially the halloween season and as if we don't have enough horrors to deal with in 2024 (laughs) (laughs) i'm kit venture camp quinn I'm Tyler at Lee, talking about the scariest thing of all, children with unsupervised internet access. <laughs> and I am Randy Mar- Wait, is that a kid down there? Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> well, I'm dead now, and it turns out ghosts are real, so I'm Randy Martin, and as a ghost now. Yay! Randy, were you holding a jelly donut by any chance when you fell? Oh, that's what that was. I thought that was my brain splattered on the pavement. Oh, okay. If you find the handbook for the recently deceased, you'll be like 400,000th in line. <laughs> oh, great. Nothing I'm not familiar with. Yeah, just don't summon the green guy with hair and you'll be fine. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. There, I did it. You're working with a professional here! Yay! Hooray! <laughs> <All right. laughs> so today, we go all the way back to the very far off year of 2021 hey want to feel old 2021 was 30 years ago (laughs) it feels like it was anyway oh my god it does this is the (sighs) slowest decade i've ever went through man can you believe we've been doing this podcast well into our 60s at this point what the hell's up with that (laughs) yeah can you believe we've been doing our podcast well into our 60s at this point i have dementia by the way This was supposed to be the roaring 20s. This was supposed to be the time of renewal and not Republican bullshit taking over the world despite the Democrats being in charge. Well, 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 it turns out for us, this is the year of Lifetime movies. Hooray! So we don't normally journey this close to the current timeline, but we came across this movie on fucking Instagram reels and we just had to talk about it. Oh, yeah. I specifically was the one that pitched this. Uh, I'll tell you guys what specifically the moment was that made me say we need to fucking talk about this movie later on when we get to it. But this really is a hot fucking mess. Like, we're the opposite of Escape from Vault Disney. We technically do allow centrist fence sitting because we have the donation box option, but... Some movies are just in a category all their own that they can't be defined by a single rating. Like, I almost don't even want to just review this movie. I just want to tell everybody, stop everything what you're doing. Watch this goddamn movie for yourself. Watch this movie and then go shower for 20 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) But that life-changing experience you get from just a glorious piece of garbage like this. Like, it is garbage, but it's... Unlike, say, Snow Globe or Mr. Troop Mom, it is beautiful garbage. Oh, This yeah. is what I love about Lifetime. I think Lifetime has been around for like 20 or 30 years or so. Oh, yeah. And the quality of their filmmaking just has not changed whatsoever since they start. I really thought this movie was from like 2008 or something. Even with the iPhones in it, I thought it was from 2008. And that said, Lifetime is at the least entertaining, unlike Hallmark, which is just fucking boring. What is Lifetime but a trashier Hallmark, you know? Exactly. And that's why Lifetime is better. Lifetime is not ashamed of its trashiness. And what's funny is that Lifetime has basically like a million versions of the bad seed at this point, and this could arguably be considered one of them, which is funny because just a few years ago, they actually had a remake of the bad seed starring McKenna fucking Grace. (laughs) Lifetime makes movies with subjects in it that scare housewives, but they can't be too scary for the housewives. Exactly. (laughs) Although I'm just scared to see who the Candace Cameron of Lifetime is. Oh my god. (laughs) God, don't don't get me started on that. I'll talk about her when we get to her, although apparently there is a Stan Lee of Lifetime, basically. Oh my god? Yeah, it's the woman who plays Gabrielle, apparently. (laughs) She's been in nearly every Lifetime movie, and- Oh my god. Yeah, so we are entering an entire new world here. I think they should have had Stan Lee play the, uh, whatever the name of the celebrity the kid was obsessed with was. 
Exactly. Which is funny because I was expecting this was going to be a movie where nobody would ever have even an IMDb page ever again. But turns out the main girl, Patty Cragton, she now plays Sally in all the Peanuts specials on Apple TV. Holy shit. So yeah, she she went on to better things. Talk about an upgrade. Yeah. Yeah. So as I said, um, honestly, one of the biggest compliments I can give this movie already, it is miles better than Mr. Troop Mom and light years better than Snow Globe. Mr. Troop Mom doesn't have anybody die in it. Yeah. (laughs) Except for George Lopez's soul, I guess. (laughs) And his career, technically. And I guess that taxidermy bear counts. Yeah, and Jane Lynch's soul as well. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So this movie was directed by someone by the name of Curtis Crawford, who is not a stranger to uh, Lifetime, as it turns out. He's directed and produced several movies. This included. He's also produced movies such as Mommy's Little Star. What? There's a mommy version of this? Oh, I guess so. (laughs) Uh, Hey, I got a great idea to save money on some writing. Take this and just reverse the genders. Also, looking at his IMDb, when I first saw the movie Cyber Stalker on his page, I thought it said Cyber Bully at first, and I was like, oh my god, he's responsible for it. I can't get the cat on. Okay, so Mommy's Little Star follows 12-year-old Olivia, who becomes a social media star, in order to impress her mother. But her mother's new boyfriend intends more than just help managing her career, and throws her into a world of betrayal, jealousy, and even murder. Do we have to talk about this next Halloween? Oh, God. You know, after Quiet On Set, I think I've gotten enough of my fulfill of children being abused by stage parents, if that's oh, what I yeah, thought. I didn't <laughs> <know that. laughs> yeah, but we'll see. Never say never. 2024, the year of child abuse. Ugh. He also produced Mommy's Little Girl and Mommy's Little Boy, which are essentially the same goddamn movie. <laughs> Hey, they're saving money on scripts, I guess. So evil kid movies to Lifetime are basically like what Christmas movies are to Hallmark. Okay. Yes. (laughs) Yes, they are. Huzzah. So now where are we going to get the uh, Christmas movie about an evil child? Yes. (laughs) Isn't that just a better watch out? I guess. Is it? Ah, Good question, actually. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I basically don't have any preconceptions. I'm ready to just jump into this thing because... We are in for a fucking ride. Literally, because this movie starts off with a wholesome bike ride between the the titular daddy's perfect little girl and the daddy. Yeah. And (laughs) what else should happen but attempted vehicular manslaughter? Huzzah. It's like this Billy Zane looking motherfucker accidentally hits the dad and Ella just goes berserk and nearly kills him. You know what? No, she was totally justified because the motherfucker was literally looking at his phone while driving. And how does he not know what a fucking speed limit is? My guy, you shouldn't have a license. Should have fucking killed him. I wish he did. Here's the thing. I bet. If the dad just said, you know what, fuck it, Ella, go crazy on that motherfucker, none of this shit would have happened. She would have gotten it out of her system and be like, oh, wow, suddenly I am 100% mentally stable now. Thanks, dad. (laughs) Yeah, the dad is way too chill towards the fact that this dude literally almost fucking killed him accidentally. In all fairness, this dad is the definition of way too chill about things you should not be chill about. (laughs) Yeah, I feel bad because I'm sure his actor is a nice person, but he's not a great actor, honestly. So he doesn't really manage to pull this off, and he just clearly does not want to be there. Wait, so you, you're you telling me that someone in a Lifetime movie was phoning it in? Oh, the what? Lord, I know. <laughs> Shocked, I tell you. Also, the dad looks way too much like a big morph of Ryan Gosling, Gavin Newsom, and fucking Matt Gates, and it was uncomfortable to look at. I couldn't unsee it either. Uh, oh my god. <laughs> he should have been. I was getting more Ryan Gosling than anything, but Jesus Christ. There was work done on his face for sure. Oh my god, if there's ever a sequel to the Barbie movie, he should play a bootleg Ken. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> my name's men <laughs> and also the dad's talking about how pistachio ice cream is the best ice cream flavor wow barney must have gotten him hooked on them now something something the kid from spongebob going <laughs> but i don't like pistachio then why did you ask for it <laughs> or milo murphy joke here i don't know <laughs> oh man the funniest part is right after when the dad goes up to the girl and then just starts, like, 
regurgitating exposition like nothing else. Like, I know your mother was killed by her abusive boyfriend and you watched her die right in front of you. Blah, 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 blah. I love it when shitty movies do that shit. I, I don't know why. <laughs> it's not even that. The dialogue that you're talking about is extremely clunky because yeah. he says note for note, I know you lost your biological mother and then you lost your adoptive mother. Someone was paid to write this. Probably not much. (laughs) Which I love that backstory, by the way, on how the other mom died. It's like, oh, she found out she was sick literally after adopting Ella. So it's like, I know that that illness can be unpredictable, but good Lord, you didn't check to see, okay, maybe we should check to make sure we'll both be alive for our adopted child. Welcome to my home, Ella. So happy to have you here. First day in your new family. By the way, I have terminal everything cancer and i'm gonna die tomorrow i have dmd disney mom disease yep (laughs) or anime mom with a side braid disease (laughs) if you know you know (laughs) and also we got to talk about fucking albert this motherfucker oh yes so in a movie obviously written by out of touch boomers We have an out-of-touch boomer character who literally comes in and starts bitching at the dad that Ella keeps crossing into his yard to get to her friend's house, which is right behind his house. And he literally just straight up starts shit-talking his parenting ethics. And I was just praying, just praying that the dad would just literally knock him out mid-sentence. You parents these days, letting your kids get away with everything. How are they going (laughs) to... I got good news for you, Tyler. (laughs) Oh, yeah. We'll get to that, but... Not to spoil it, but I've got good news for you. Also, it didn't help that he looked a lot like a very old George Soros. He looked like if Walter Matthau stopped giving a shit. He looked like an elderly version of the guy from Hannah Montana that kept complaining about leaves in his hot tub. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, yeah, that guy. (laughs) Uh, Also, how the fuck did he not hear the dishwasher being opened? Like, that seems like the most obvious setup ever. Before that, when, uh, when that boomer Albert leaves, the girl, she asks, Why is he so mean? I was expecting the dad to go, Well, honey, it all started when the generation before his started putting lead in the paint. Wait a minute. This was 2021. Where was Albert on January 6th? Well, honey, let me just tell you about a little thing called dementia. (laughs) You know, you know well where he was. Not only that. He was not masking. He was the one who was taking a shit in Nancy Pelosi's office. Let's be real. I could see him being the posing with the podium guy. (laughs) He has the Viking helmet on. You know what? I ship him and Mima. Huzzah. But yeah, going back to the dishwasher scene, this is the first glimpse we get of, you know, Ella's issues, quote unquote, where the dad says he's got to go to work. And then all of a sudden, I'm I'm not sure why she does this, but she pulls a knife out and cuts her finger. And her screams are basically what introduced the housekeeper. The, this character gets no proper introduction whatsoever. And she just happens to live in the house or can just manifest anywhere. Like, they never explain if she lives with them or if she fucking lives somewhere else. It's It's insane how she just lives in this fucking kitchen. Also, there's a common theme with this character where she does not mind her fucking business at all. (laughs) Literally, she comes in in one scene and just straight up admits, hey, I was listening to this conversation. Uh, Yeah, can I put my two cents in for a second? Uh, It's like, I guess the logic of why Ella stabbed her own finger was to try to get her dad to stay home that night, but it doesn't fucking work because he's like, let's plan a weekend sometime in the future. Like... What? First of all, one, she's clearly had no issue with her dad going to work previous times because they live in a giant fucking house, which is another thing I've noticed Yeah, about, like, Lifetime and Hallmark movies, is that nobody ever lives in, like, a normal small house or, like, an apartment or something. Everyone lives in those giant brand spanking new estate houses. It's clearly just the production crew's houses. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is a very wealthy family because somehow, you know... Well, we know how. He works at a fucking ad agency, but it's because he has this beautiful house. He can afford a housekeeper. He can afford to take his daughter on a weekend trip to Adventure Camp, which get used to hearing that phrase, guys. (laughs) Adventure Camp. It's just so funny to me because the fact that he can afford all this shit and has a job 
But like now she has a problem with that. <laughs> yeah. And also they're trying so hard to convince us, I guess, that this is in LA because at one point one of the other managers' driver's licenses shows as being from Los Angeles, but it's so fucking clearly not LA. Oh no, no, no. This takes place in Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Because you see Pennsylvania license plates and you see a Pennsylvania driver's license oh, later right, on in the, right. in the movie. I'm not gonna spoil what happens there. You can't fool me. I know North Attleboro when I see it. <laughs> yeah, this was filmed in Ontario, though. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I guess they wanted to go there to avoid tax stuff, I guess. It's lifetime. Why even bother having it take place in Pennsylvania? Just have it take place in Ontario. It'll be fine. But, 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 but America. Lifetime. Television for idiots. It would make a lot more sense for this to take place in L.A. because we're jumping ahead, obviously, but kind of what kickstarts the conflict of the movie is that Ella is basically a hardcore stan of this actress named Juliet Lee. She's a lead on what I can only describe as Pretty Little Liars, but it was filmed on a shoestring budget. Mom, can I have Pretty Little Liars? We have Pretty Little Liars at home. So this series is basically her pink opaque, and she uses it basically to guide her own life, only instead of it being a trans metaphor, it's a murder metaphor. <laughs> yeah, and here's what makes it confusing, is that, uh, so the movie kind of sets it up, like, you know, Twisted Pretty, which is the show in universe, is kind of like this world famous show, but I guess it's properly filmed in Pennsylvania, because... They have Juliet Lee on set filming this commercial in Pennsylvania, but is Twisted Pretty like a local show that somehow became famous or something? How does this work? It's so weird. And also, I swear to God, the dad is always like, oh, I'm so busy. I have all this stuff to do. You own the casting agency, apparently. So you could basically set up your own fucking schedule. So how? I'm too busy. I have stuff to do. Movie starts with them having time to have a father-daughter bike ride. They have one commercial they do the entire fucking movie. So, like, what what agency does this do? And that's another thing, too. Juliet Lee is supposed to be, like, I guess sort of like a B-list actress, but for some reason she's doing a commercial for something that she's not properly, like, sponsored by. Yeah, and also, whenever you make a fake celebrity in a movie, if you're not going to get, like, an actual celebrity to play them, then you at the least have to make sure the actor is compelling enough to be justifiably seen as an actor in universe. Like, say what you will about Hannah Montana, but I bought Selena Gomez being a celebrity even before she was famous when she played the rival on that show. This show? No. I mean, this girl does not want to be here, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, God, in more ways than one. Uh, she knows what type of movie she's in. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I could see her going, yeah, it's 11. Like one of the Flintstones animal gadgets and having that goofy ass music play after. I will say that I love how she's channeling her clear disdain in the being in this movie into her role. Because the way she is just so cold to Ella literally got me laughing like <laughs> i felt so bad for this child but then i remembered oh no she's a fucking murderer oh yeah wait a minute this child is evil let's be real if some person was going up to me and saying a bunch of parasocial shit and comparing me to my character i'd reject giving them a selfie too <laughs> she was like going full-blown ricardo lopez on her i surprised she didn't call the cops you just know that Ella is one of the people mad on Twitter right now that Chapel Roan dares to ask for boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> and so then also, going back a bit, it's so clear Kinsley fucking hates her. I never once buy their friendship. Yeah, what does Kinsley see in her as a friend? I was like, Kinsley, go find better friends. I never once thought that these two ever liked each other because the first exchange that we see of them together is just Ella rubbing it in her face that she's going to be meeting Juliet Lee and going to adventure camp. They have just such a big Cartman and the other boys energy. Like, you could just tell they don't actually like her. <laughs> Kingsley and Ella's friendship reminds me of, you know, when you had a hard time making friends, so you would just, like, decide to be friends with the first bitch who acknowledged your existence. 
And then you would be like, I regret ever fucking giving this person the time of day ever since. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In that same scene, too, we get a glimpse of just how out of touch the writers are. Because literally out of nowhere, when they're talking about Juliet Lee, Kingsley will just say, let's look at Juliet Lee's latest posts. Because, you know, these 50-something-year-olds definitely have a grasp on how kids this generation talk i guess how do you do fellow kids yes and also this movie has my absolute favorite genre of movie music songs that are very clearly ripoffs of popular songs that we couldn't license like the good 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 songs. feel good i feel good that's literally the fucking lyrics to the song You could tell they wanted to get good time by Owl City or something like. (laughs) Ah, the finest music APM's back catalog can supply. (laughs) Similar to the fucking Hoku ripoff at the beginning of Mr. Troop Mom. Somehow worse. Yeah. Somehow worse than that. Literally. It sounded like an AI made it. (laughs) Honestly, it feels like an AI wrote this entire goddamn script. Let's be real. I could see it. Honestly, I feel like even ChatGPT would look at this and be like, yeah, I'm not getting paid enough for this shit. <laughs> oh, and God. also, there's no cameras on this set that would have seen Ella just push down the giant light set. Instead, nobody's just watching it. Sure. There's literally someone standing right behind her as she does it. And when the dad comes over and, and Ella's lying, like, oh, no, it just fell out of nowhere. I was I was fully expecting the woman to just turn around and say, uh, actually, no, I, I saw your daughter push that down that woman was like you know what i don't get paid enough for this shit just let whatever (laughs) happens happen she just wanted something to break the day basically (laughs) like you know what this is exciting for me all right this is my life now also the dad keeps basically thinking that hot chocolate is an entire part of ella's personality so hot chocolate to this movie is what honey is to the country bears movie i guess (laughs) (laughs) does that make this kid a drunk These child stars start so early. Before that, too, we get introduced to the love interest and the love interest's son, uh, Xander. And basically how he gets introduced is that when Ella keeps, like, hounding Juliet Lee for the selfie, she sees him, and she gets all horny, obviously, and she goes up to him, asks if she can take a selfie with him, right in front of Ella, directly after she asked. That was intentional. That was petty. Insult the goddamn injury. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, he wasn't parasocial with me, so it's okay. <laughs> All I wanted was a selfie. Just one selfie. And she wouldn't give it to me. Just a selfie. It's her joker. I fucking love that that's her fucking joker. Just. <laughs> get what you fucking deserve. Uh, also xander gets all bitchy about having to lift a small bench with his mom but he has no problem lifting a giant table and he's an athlete too so why would that be a problem (laughs) oh that's another thing too so i guess juliet lee is supposed to be in like her mid late 20s or something but xander's a teenager i guess does she have him while she was in the fucking womb or something Let's see. Yeah, the actor for him looks like he's in his 20s, so he's not a teenager. (laughs) He's supposed to be a teenager, though. That's the thing. Which it can be pulled off, but he's very clearly too old for this role. Hey, if Grease can cast people in their 30s as teenagers, so can we. Very true. (laughs) And also, so they're trying to set up a whole plot in this movie where Ella has a fake friendship with Juliet Lee through her phone and pictures of her. And basically, they're trying to set it up like a Harvey situation, I guess. Yeah, and the way they do it, too, is they keep showing her Instagram profile. But the Instagram profile has this 2011-looking interface that looks like shit. And it's the same picture every time she opens it. Like, why not have the the actress basically pretend to be a manifestation in her mind and basically be telling her to do all this shit? I was thinking the same thing. They really should have went all out and have her be Ella's Tyler Durden or Drop yes. Dead Fred or whatever. Exactly. Or, and hell, put her in a bunny costume and make it north. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there's, like, literally straight-up moments where, like, Ella will say, But Juliet Lee told me to kill him. 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 Kill him.
<laughs> and like it's never established that this has been going on at all. I mean, she's talking to her and like getting parasocial. Even fucking invites her to adventure camp. She literally just straight up DMs her and says, "Hey, it was nice to meet you. You want to go to adventure camp with me and uh, my dad?" Jesus Christ! Like I said, future Ricardo Lopez in the making. Just get the Darth Maul paint over with. Good Basically, Lord. how Juliet treated her was how Danny Tamborelli should have treated me when I met him. Yes. Aww. <laughs> you were actually nice to him. So. Yeah. Uh, I was, but... <sighs> well, you didn't, yeah. like, demand selfies and then have a parasocial relationship with him where he tells you to kill people. <laughs> uh, you're gonna want to sit down for... Oh, it's... God, Danny! I might have gotten into some legal trouble over the past few years, but uh, I digress. This is the world's greatest dad, by the way, because after his daughter cuts her finger, after she nearly fucking dies because of a light set falling on set, he is convinced somehow to leave her home alone. Just greatest dad of the year. How he adopted a kid, we will never know. Uh, a wizard did it to punish him. Oh, God. And that's right, because in between this, we get this scene where she gets dropped off at Kingsley's house. And she just straight up pretends that she and Juliet Lee are fucking besties. And, like, Kingsley is just not having any of this fucking bullshit. And it was at this point that I noticed that whenever someone wears a bike helmet in this movie, the Razor logo that's on the side is just covered up in the laziest fucking way possible. (laughs) Where it's just the last letter covered up. So it just reads Razo. (laughs) Bulletproof. <laughs> Which sounds like a porn site, by the way, Razo. I mean, in this universe, it probably fucking is. Yeah. Also, Gabrielle keeps talking about how her mom bought a house in Albany, and of course, my brain just had to keep going to steamed hams. <laughs> oh, God. And of yeah, course, Marissa. Right. Shout yeah. out. <laughs> Watch out for psycho children, Marissa. We love you. Well, that's the thing. Gabrielle pretty much has fuck all to do in this movie other than just show up. Yeah. I guess. I mean, she does serve, like, a purpose for, like, a brief second. Her mom serves more of a purpose. Yeah, her mom is more of a fucking character. (laughs) We know more about her than shit. (laughs) <laughs> and that's right too we skipped over the bit where Ella's like so pissed off she's coping and seething about the whole Juliet Lee cock block situation she just goes into Albert's yard and just fucking destroys his flowers based <laughs> which like based but also like what did you think was gonna happen <laughs> there's this establishing shot at the film set where it's like this giant fucking movie studio then we see inside of it and it's like this cheap fucking student film looking set. The outside of the building looked like a church, I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But yeah, there's the scene where they drive past, they see Albert packing his car, and uh, the dad goes like, maybe he's going to see his kids like he does every month. And I was fully expecting him to finish the sentence with, better them than us, right? <laughs> Nah, his kids don't want anything to do with him. They're like, we sent him out there. We bought him that house just so he'd leave us alone. (laughs) And we purposefully chose a house near a killer child. (laughs) And then, also, I love that he fucking films Ella walking outside on the driveway, but he doesn't fucking present the stamped on flowers as proof. Yeah, that was the flimsiest fucking evidence, because he comes to the dad and says, your daughter was fucking destroying my flowers. Doesn't show the flowers. No. Oh, before that, too, we should mention the interaction that Ella has with him, where she basically just tells him to kill himself. It's because she's watching a show where they basically say that line. Yeah, because she's watching Twisted Pretty and, like, Juliet Lee is talking about her character's dad's murderer. And she's like, man, I just wish he'd fucking kill himself. And she does the noose tying thing. And then Ella goes downstairs. She sees the neighbor pissed off looking in the window, screaming at her. And every time this dude fucking yells, it sounds like his voice is just pitched down an octave. You destroyed my flowers. Ella, you stamped on my flowers. I saw what you did. You destroyed my flowers. She goes up to the window, looks him dead in the eye, and perfectly, with no practice at all, does the noose tying thing and makes this fucking face. 
And somehow he doesn't record that and he doesn't fucking report that to the police. It's like, that's a genuine death threat and he doesn't do anything. <laughs> also, it's like, that's one of those scenes you can just tell it was just put there for the housewife shock value because it would get the housewives all like, oh, how unorthodox of a child to do. <laughs> Well, this makes me so angry that I could come up with some fucking overly complicated scenario where I fantasize about hitting a child. Yay! Why, I need to write to my governor about this. I'm just saying, if you find reasons to defend child abuse because of a Lifetime movie... Fuck you! Yeah, that's my message for you. Fuck you and kiss my ass. If anything, yep. this is more likely to just cause, like, a moral panic. <laughs> exactly. We have to start a moral panic about this and get the government involved. And speaking of questionable elements, oh my god. I don't know if this was accidental, and I should also add, I am white, so I want to be very careful how I discuss this, but the way that Ella is deliberately trying to frame several black people as evil and pulling white tears... Ooh, I don't like that. Yeah, I noticed that too. What the fuck is up with that? I think that's entirely justifiable to say. Yeah, that is... The way she literally lies about Xander hitting her and fucking tries to get him in trouble. Oh my god, she... She's a fucking Karen. Oh my god. She is. She really fucking is. And the way her only friend is black too and she treats her like shit. Yes, Ooh. that too. I don't like it. <laughs> Holy shit. Yes, that's right. Ella's Ugh. just a racist little shit. Literally, white woman tears in the making. Yeah. And I'm not gonna lie. Kingsley is the best fucking character in this movie. She really is. She's one of the few characters in this movie with a working brain. Yes. <laughs> yes. She's the only one who knows what type of movie she's in, basically. Oh, yeah. She knows she's involved in a bunch of white fucking nonsense, so she's gonna make the most out of it. God, I, I love this kid. I really do. Also, I would have loved if Xander basically started being the detective of this movie, because he literally goes up and tells her, I'm sorry you got hurt, but I know you're faking it. Ugh, base Xander. I don't know if that was supposed to be her thinking he said that or not, but that would have been cool. Just have him follow her around the movie and just try to prove her bullshit. Oh, actually, here's the thing. Nobody even needs to prove her bullshit because, like, in this movie, every single time after her fake tears from doing something, she gets her way, she smirks at whoever she was fucking over. Nobody fucking calls her out. Never. No. Even when I was a dumbass child, when I was bullshitting my way out of something, I knew not to smirk while people were still in the room after I did it. <laughs> She's fucking telling on herself so hard. <laughs> oh my god. She is so bad at hiding evidence. Literally. This is one of my favorite ways I used to bullshit out of stuff. When I was a kid, uh, when we had a dog... And I had food that was gross that I didn't want to eat. I'd be like, well, okay, I'm going to the bathroom. Wait for the dog to get out and be like, oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, the dog got it. That's too bad. <laughs> and I never smirked while I did that. <laughs> so it's like the, oh, well, she's just a kid. She doesn't know. That's no excuse. Even I knew as a kid. I was a stupid kid. Exactly. And also, I love that when Ella joins her dad at the office, Gabrielle isn't creeped out at all by Ella just randomly showing up in the office. And she's not creeped out by her asking where her mom lives. No, that's uh, Ella will just be in places she's not supposed to be. And nobody bats an eye at it. Yeah, because Ella just has like this complete fucking breakdown. Because Gabrielle talks to the dad. She's like, listen, my mom needs to be settled into her new home. But the problem is, it's on the weekend when you guys are going to adventure camp. So you're going to have to cancel. And she loses her fucking shit. Which, on one hand, was very stupid of Ella. But on the other hand, why couldn't the dad just shut down the agency for a few days so they could both have that time off? He owns it. Does the agency not have more than one person that can handle this kind of stuff? It's lifetime business logic. It's like there's always exactly three people working in this big-ass company. I, I mean, every time I've worked at an office, when there was a planned vacation, you know, there was always like a contingency plan or some shit. They act like this casting agency is retail. It's like retail would be more realistic for not being able to get time off. I feel like people who write for Lifetime just really don't have a grasp on how the world properly works they really so, don't yeah yeah they really are boomers 
Yeah, they're probably just super rich and don't know how regular life works, so. (laughs) But remember, it's our generation that has everything handed to us. Yeah. We're the ones with participation trophies. I'm not expecting the highest intelligence levels out of people who make movies whose sole plot is something we can make a moral panic out of. Tanya, you've been going to those parties where girls do oral sex for bracelets. That's right. (gasps) She goes to those parties, which are a real thing. So Ella literally throws a temper tantrum and then goes into Gabrielle's office. And at this point, you know, Gabrielle is on the phone call with her mom. And it's one of those, what's that, mom? Yeah, I can loudly mention what you want over the phone for contrived plot reasons. (laughs) And it's because she can mention that, you know, her mom likes blueberry yogurt. And we'll get to that. At first, I'm not going to lie, I thought that Ella was going to get the stuff from the movie The Stuff and <laughs> feed it to her. Like, there's your yogurt. <laughs> Here's your yogurt, bitch. <laughs> In the words of Octavia Spencer, eat my shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then also, later on, Cecily and Xander joined them for dinner. And as Cecily and Ella are spending time together, Ella suddenly starts victim-blaming her own mother Yeah, no, what the fuck was up with this? Because earlier in the movie, she literally has PTSD from seeing her mother die in the same room. Yeah, by her abusive boyfriend. And then all of a sudden, when she's reminiscing about her mother, she was like, maybe she doesn't deserve to be missed. Oh, scary child, scary child, moral panic, scare the housewives, scare the housewives. Make up your fucking mind. Do you miss her or do you not? Oh, look at that. If you die from an abusive boyfriend in front of your kid, they might blame you. We gotta alert the government. Another thing is, this movie cannot fucking decide if Ella is a Rhoda or a Carrie. Because they keep fucking insisting, oh, she's so bent down by the world. She's suffered more than most people will ever suffer. By the way, the dad literally says that word for word. Yep. (laughs) Which is so funny. Fuck you, marginalized people, I guess. You know, not to get too into it, but I have, you know, been in Ella's shoes in dealing with, you know, abandonment and all that. Still never fucking killed anybody. Yeah. Apparently that's a Herculean feat, according to Lifetime. Uh, I've dealt with several deaths of relatives. Not a murderer, believe it or not. I mean, I got issues. I haven't killed anyone yet. God, we're shit-talking boomers, but we all sound like them right now. It's okay for us to be boomers. And this movie cannot decide if this is supposed to be a power fantasy movie where a person who's been abused by nearly everybody finally gets their revenge, or if she's just fucking evil. It's like, oh, feel sorry for this kid, but also she gets so mad over the most trivial shit. It's like, a death in your family is not comparable to you not being able to attend a fucking camp. Yeah! <laughs> No, 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 Kit, Kit, I'm sorry. It's not just any camp, okay? This is adventure camp. You're right. This is game changing. This is life or death we're talking about here. Are you seriously (laughs) going to say this little girl deserves to be deprived of adventure camp? That's child abuse. You're the child abuser, Kit. Also, the way that they present the way that Ella takes care of Gabrielle and her mom is there's an episode of Twisted Pretty where they fucking put Tide Pods in yogurt. Oh, Tide Pods! Tide Pods, moral panic! Tide Pods, moral panic! Get scared! Get scared! (laughs) How you can tell this was written in the late 2010s, early 2020s because of the fucking (laughs) stupid Tide Pod panic. It's like, (laughs) it started as a dumb joke about stuff you wish you could eat. We're not actually fucking eating them. You know what's awesome? During that whole Tide Pod meme thing, some Australian, like, hard candy company made a hard candy that looked like Tide Pods. And oh, hell so yeah. I, didn't- I heard about those, but I never actually s- confirmed if they were a real thing. That's the thing. We actually ended up finding a way to safely eat Tide Pods. <laughs> That's actually genius. Huzzah. We were smart for that. <laughs> exactly. So there's two things I love about that Twisted Pretty segment. First off, Ella looks it up on this thing called Flixia TV, which is like this fake ass streaming service and but it's the kind of streaming service where all the shows you watch skip to the most convenient part for some reason (laughs) second uh juliet lee is literally talking about you know how tide pods taste like candy no they fucking don't no they taste like soap i'm pretty sure they taste like soap i know what soap tastes like 
Who wrote this? And I don't care how well you mix it in. You are going to fucking taste Tide Pod. Like, when I was a kid, I used to take ADHD medication. And at one point, they suggested, if she doesn't want to swallow it, try emptying the powder out of it into yogurt. I tried that. It was fucking nasty. I hated it. I tasted that shit. Yeah, no. I went to a breakfast diner one time and got a breakfast sandwich. And I knew they had cleaned the griddle beforehand because I could still taste the cleaning chemicals. Ew. Oh, There's a very distinct taste to this shit. Yep. And three, Juliet Lee's talking about how she wants to poison her mother's boyfriend. And she's like, so you're going to poison him to death? What? No, I'm not going to kill someone. I'll just slip enough into his food so that he can't go on his precious trip to Europe with his slutty new girlfriend. So at least she has standards, I guess. You can still die from Tide Pods, though. I don't want to stab him. I just want to gently put my knife between his organs. Just he ran into <laughs> my knife ten times. <laughs> I don't want to slit his throat. I just want to cut it open and let a little blood come out and then sew it back. <laughs> See, you don't understand. I don't want to kill him. I just want to make him not alive anymore. I never kill people. I just got people. Also, we forgot to talk about how when Ella is info dumping to Cecily about, you know, her mom, she also brings up her stepmother. She goes, That's Carol. She's not my real mom, but she was super nice and she always let me do her makeup. Like you. So then I guess your dad isn't your real dad either, so. Oh, but if you said that to her, you'd be on her fucking hit list. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my god, she probably killed the stepmom. She probably pulled the ego from Guardians 2 shit on her. Oh my god. It broke my heart to put that tumor in her head. What? No, no, all right. I know that sounds bad. Y you know what? Not only is this child racist, this child also seems very misogynistic. Ella go. <laughs> this Ella. child is a right winger. Yep. <laughs> and we get to the best scene in the movie that's featured all over Instagram. This is the scene that tipped us in to this beautiful fucking movie that yes. we still have issues with, don't get me wrong. So, <laughs> Ella goes to the supermarket to get Tide Pods. She literally sneaks into the supermarket, gets two Tide Pods out of a container. Who should come in at that exact moment but fucking Albert himself? I love that all these people, by the way, just live in the same neighborhood. Like, not just Albert, but Gabrielle and her mom as well. Somehow, at that exact fucking moment, he walks in on her, taking two Tide Pods out of a container, chases her down with a stupid fucking wobble. <laughs> and we uh -huh. get that beautiful exchange of dialogue, just... What are you up to? Nothing! Let me see your pockets. No! You can't tell me what to do! If you don't show me, I'll march right in there and tell the store owner... And they'll call the police! See? Nothing! Leave me alone before I call the police on you! I'm gonna tell your dad, when he gets home from work today, what you're up to. So, I want to break this scene down bit by bit. You know, first off, you know, when Boomer McFuckface catches her, I'm forgetting his name, I don't care what, I don't care what his name is, he's always gonna be some measurable fucking Boomer to me. <laughs> Valid. When he finds out, he chases her out of the store with this stupid fucking wobble. <laughs> and she literally outright says, don't touch me, I'll scream. Which, based... Yes! <laughs> fuck that fucking boomer. See, she was right for that, if nothing else. Yes, she was. And he gets pissed off at her. He doesn't point out that she shoplifted or whatever. He's just mad at her because he just so happens to be at the store let's be real she didn't have to do anything to actually make him mad she just had to exist i mean he he kind of acknowledges it in that he says you know i'm gonna tell the store owner what you did dude it's two tide pods out of a giant container no one's gonna fucking give a shit <laughs> i worked retail if, if i found out someone took a single tide pod out of the container i'd be like and okay it's That's like, not okay, my problem. There's still like 20 in there. What's the big deal? Remember, kids, if you saw somebody shoplift, no, no you didn't. didn't. Nope, you saw nothing. <laughs> and I think my favorite part of this scene is that Albert is just so fucking stupid. He falls for the pretend it's in my pockets, but then take it out and put them behind my back so he doesn't see it trick. Yep. <laughs> He's that fucking dumb. 
Oh my god. Just beautiful. It's Okay, I'm going to quote Luke the Last Jedi here. Every decision this movie made is wrong. <laughs> yep. It, everything in this movie works, but it works for the wrong reasons. Yep. <laughs> and then the aftermath of that scene is just as fucking beautiful because she follows him back to his house, comes into his yard, and he gets pissed off. She yells at her, what are you doing in my yard? Get out of here now or I'm calling the police. And then she says, you're not telling my daddy anything. And then <laughs> she somehow has the strength to knock him off of his fucking ladder 40 yeah. feet off the ground. <laughs> and it kills him. He and dies. His brains are on the pavement. And there's a Wilhelm scream because of course <laughs> What are you doing? Stop! When, when I was watching this on Instagram, I legit thought that the Wilhelm scream was put in by the uploader. No, it's in the fucking movie. Yes. Holy shit. Also, I love that she doesn't think, oh, if I push the ladder, uh, they're not going to find my fingerprints on it or anything. Just... Yeah, yeah, the police didn't investigate this. <laughs> there is police because they show up at the scene of the crime when that fucking bald asshole comes back. Yeah. Because <laughs> he's talking to the housekeeper. He says, I wanted to drop off his drill and I found him in the back not breathing. He must have fallen off his ladder. They couldn't revive him. And knowing this asshole, I was fully expecting him to finish the sentence with, so I guess I have a new drill now. Yeah. <laughs> when the guy who finds Albert shows up, I swear to God, I thought it was the exact same guy who nearly hit the dad at the beginning of the movie. That was him. Oh, that was. Okay. Yeah, that was him. That was the same guy. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of shocking that Ella didn't take that drill and just drill a fucking hole into his skull, but I digress. <laughs> <laughs> Go full driller killer. <laughs> yeah. The driller killer must be really yeah, thrilling. <laughs> and also, somehow, like I said, Gabrielle and her mom just happen to live in the exact same neighborhood, and Ella can just bike all the way over to random houses at will. And so then she also manages to find a way to sneak into the house, which. No, no, this dumbass boomer, because so many dumbass boomers in this movie. She literally leaves the back door unlocked. Yeah. Ella sneaks in, cuts the Tide Pod open, dips it in, and in, in the middle of this, she rips a hole into her shirt. So then Ella puts the Tide Pod into the blueberry yogurt. Which, again, nobody's going to find fingerprints on, I guess. Yeah. And then the mother comes home right after she leaves. Ella somehow sneaks out in time, and the mother just goes to town on this fucking yogurt. You've never gone to town on some yogurt before? It's like, I like yogurt, but not that much, unless it's the Danimal sweepstakes to meet Zack and Cody, I guess. I don't know, that Yoplait strawberry goes pretty hard. And after all this, Ella is watching this from the window, being totally sneaky, and she mutters to herself, Looks like I'm going to adventure camp after all. <laughs> no, you're fucking not. Your dad still canceled the fucking reservation, you dumbass. What is this, a Disney Channel movie? The way that she's describing this camp, if she's literally killing people over it, then I'm just like, this camp better be fucking worth it. Spoiler alert, <laughs> it's not. You know what? I really wish that she would have gone there and all of a sudden you see George Lopez. There, that's your punishment. You're stuck with him. <laughs> You're stuck with him and his fuck ass monologues. Well, honey, meet your new dad. <laughs> and pratfall after pratfall. <laughs> so then finally, the fucking cops and ambulance show up. And that's when Larissa gets all suspicious suddenly. Like, oh, Ella has a hole in her shirt. That has to be connected somehow. <laughs> yeah, because she does that. And then she deduces the fact that, you know, she doesn't put the knives into the dishwasher with the sharp side up. Get Larissa on the Zodiac Killer case. She can finally <laughs> track down his identity. Maybe it's just me, but I kind of feel like that's a bit of a stretch. Yeah. Like, I feel like it's easy to, like, put the wrong side up by accident. Literally. And it's like, we do that sometimes, but to be fair, we don't have children at our house, so. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have to worry about that shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, also, I kind of love that the entire crux of this movie is that Ella keeps trying to get her own way, 
but the universe keeps fucking her over. Yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe if you weren't such a little bitch. Yeah. Because it turns out that uh, Cecily has connections to uh, the adventure camp, and she got them tickets for that weekend. And everybody's going together. <laughs> so they all go on vacation to this adventure camp. And it's just the most basic, boring campground imaginable. The first part of the vacation is literally just someone's house. Don't get me wrong, it is a nice house. But then all of a sudden, she just gets the idea to just choke Xander in his sleep with a pillow. Yeah. Like, how the just... fuck do you think that was going to turn out? Like, Ella, how are you planning on getting away with that one? Like, be honest. I just love the logic in this movie. And I love that they're trying to act like this camp is the Disneyland of campgrounds. It's not even the Lake Tahoe of campgrounds or <laughs> Yellowstone. It's just a generic campground. Was this really worth a body? Well, well no, Kit, 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 you got to remember. Adventure, Adventure camp. camp. Adventure <laughs> camp. It has mountain bikes, Kit. <laughs> literally she, kit you gotta understand she literally put so much effort into watching youtube videos about how to pitch tents and stuff this is it's, big shit to her there's animal prints this camp makes lincoln woods look exciting by comparison yes and also, I love that nobody fucking checks Xander's bike before he goes mountain biking. Like, when it's a dangerous fucking trail, you want to double check the brakes. What the fuck? Yeah, so there's this guy running the mountain bike section. Somehow he's too dumb to notice that, one, a girl is writing in someone else's name that isn't even hers. And two, is hanging out in the room with all the bikes and has a pair of pliers on hand. And three doesn't bother to do a final check on any of the goddamn bikes no lawsuit now and you know what this is the one time xander gets his chance in the limelight to be a fucking stupid idiot because he doesn't sign up for the expert trail and they go oh we got the daredevil on the expert trail and instead of being like uh i didn't sign up for that he's just like oh yeah okay let's go like motherfucker you're basically spelling your own fate you were the chosen one you were supposed to destroy Ella, not join her. Also, I love how out of order the severity of Ella's crimes feel in this movie. Like, she starts by killing somebody, then she poisons somebody, then she breaks somebody's leg. And without spoilers, the way that she hurts the dad later on is so minuscule. It's like, this feels like this is completely out of order. It really does. It is. And I forgot to mention, too, during the scene where Larissa's, like, she's talking to the dad. She's, like, saying that, like, something's not right with Ella. She mentions that, you know, Albert died. I am so disappointed that the father's first reaction wasn't, oh, thank God. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, I, I'm so sad he's gone. Like, he does not give a shit, like I said. Oh, no. Anyway, last week. And somehow, again, nobody sees Ella having this big ass smirk on her face when Xander's being carried to the ambulance. No one. They do. They just memory hole it. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, this is the last time we see Xander in the movie. The rest of the time we see him, he's healing off screen. And the movie says, you know, that he has to miss out on his basketball scholarship. So, like, I feel so bad for these characters. They don't deserve to be treated so fucking poorly in this movie. Oh, he could get that scholarship by just going like, you know, oh, it's okay. Uh, what happened was something we can use as a moral panic and get, you know, some clout on. You're back in, Xander! <laughs> and Gabrielle's mom basically didn't get the house, it looks like, so I guess her mom is just homeless now. That's yeah. depressing. Wait, is this an ad agency or a real estate agency? Yes. Come on, Lifetime, pick one. Just like what we just did, the movie kind of glosses over like what happens to her mother, because they, they say at several points that she's resting off screen, she has food poisoning, and then they just kind of forget about her. Yeah. <laughs> she's dead. Like, Xander's dead. She's dead. They're all dead. They're just lying to make everybody feel better. This child is a serial killer. The baby is taking his first life. And so then Cecily finally starts picking up on what's going on and decides instead of going to the police, goes to Kinsley, despite not even knowing her. To be fair, I would also go to Kinsley instead of the police. Very true. Kinsley would solve the Zodiac case. She was right, because this girl 
has so much fucking tea and she is so proud to spill it. Oh, we forgot one part. Like, I, I can't even remember what it was about, but one of the scenes where Ella's like freaking out, thinking like she's finally gonna get caught. Kinsley calls her and she's like, Whatever, we're not friends anymore. And that kind of oh. sets up Kinsley like just spilling her guts. And then she calls Ella and tells her that she told him everything. She's like, Remember, we're not friends anymore. Fucking based. I love Kinsley. <laughs> yes. I wish Kinsley was my child. Oh my god, Kinsley inspired Greta Thunberg to expose Andrew Tate as a trafficker. Change yes. her mind. <laughs> it's like we'll find some way to make them accidentally slip up. Did Ella. you ever know that you're my hero? <laughs> also, one thing I haven't pointed out about this movie yet is that Ella whines a fucking lot in this movie, and it gets so tiring to hear after oh, a while. Oh, I can't stand like, this bitch. The girl's not a bad actor by any means. My problem is that she's so excellent that I hate her. Exactly. And it's that the script is so fucking heavy-handed that it makes the acting feel worse than it actually is. Because everything just has to be overly dramatic and everything just has to be, like, the biggest damn thing ever. Yeah! You know what her whining was reminding me of? Mm -hmm. Caillou. Oh, God! Literally, Caillou-coded. Literally the female Caillou. (laughs) What's wrong? Are you hurt? So when Cecily is finally telling the dad all about this, Ella just grabs a knife, once again, knowing full well that she'll easily get caught, tries to go stab Cecily, and just gives her dad a mild slice on his shoulder that's not life-threatening and is treated like the biggest damn thing ever. (laughs) I hurt you, Daddy! I'm so sorry! Daddy, am I still your perfect little girl? Uh, No. uh, She said it. She said it. (laughs) Uh, And then I just love that this is the thing that makes her break down. Not killing somebody, not poisoning somebody, not even breaking somebody's leg. This is the moment that breaks her. It's like, I get that her dad's her favorite person, but what? Chill out. (laughs) <laughs> and the dad just underreacts as usual he's like oh he literally treats it like she's like coming home crying because she got like bullied at school or something and it's like she just tried to kill your girlfriend yep uh, the ending of this movie is so stupid so ella goes to a mental hospital because of all of this and cecily is somehow not bothered by the fact that she's still dating a man with a murderous daughter like oh yeah she hurt my son but it'll be okay she'll get help and she won't ever be like this ever again no no i would run for the fucking hills like, yeah, they do a happy ending where the daughter is in a mental facility because she's a child murderer and they tried to give it like a Disney happy ending. Look, Daddy, I painted today and I'm going to learn how to plant flowers. I'm not a murderer. Just <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I get it. They want to tie everything up into a nice little bow and everything, but it doesn't feel earned. This needed to end like the bad seed or the good son. Ella needed to die. I'm just going to say it. It's like the crazy thing is, it's like this is based off of shit that has like actually happened. Like child murderers are a thing that exists because we live in a fucked up world. Yeah. I don't think there's happy endings in those cases where they go, look, daddy, I drew a picture. I mean, I hope there's not a happy ending for the fuckers like Kyle Rittenhouse, but I digress. (sighs) You know what? No, here's how the movie should have ended. So I would have fucking loved it if this movie pulled a Scott Tennerman with Ella's dad, the mom and Xander rubbing it in her face about how better their life is without her. (laughs) And to top it all off, they bring Juliet Lee in to fucking roast her. Like Radiohead did to Scott. Jeez, what a little crybaby. You gonna cry all day, crybaby? You know, everyone has problems. It doesn't mean you have to be a little crybaby about it. Come on, guys, let's go. This kid is totally not cool. Yeah, that's the most uncool kid I've ever met. Little crybaby. I think what should have happened is we should have just gotten, like, a view of Ella's phone. Have it just be Xander sending her a pic from the hospital with the text saying, I lived, bitch. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm coming for you. (laughs) We thought you were hungry, so we brought you a snack. They hand her a blueberry yogurt. (laughs) 
karmic justice. <laughs> <laughs> and in my mind, the way that Ella is set up is that she's literally in the fucking Hannibal Lecter, you know, just like has the mask is like completely restrained. I'm having a friend for dinner. <laughs> But, yeah, I I feel like, you know, it's one thing to have Xander and Gabrielle's mom leave the movie entirely and just say, oh, they're resting off screen. It's another thing to forgive his attempted murder and not get his say into that at all. Yeah. <laughs> just, oh, my God. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes. The devil's eyes. I spent eight years trying to reach him, and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. So, this is a keep the tapes in the most weirdest way imaginable, because it's not because it's good, by no means, it's because it is a fascinating experience of a movie. Oh no, I I wholeheartedly agree. I am so glad... We talked about this despite all its flaws. And believe me, there are plenty of flaws in this movie. This is not just to keep the tapes. This is put the tapes in a museum for shitty movies. This is like if Danny Tanner was trying to parent Henry from The Good Son. Yes. (laughs) I saw people on Letterboxd call this camp. Yep, it's camp. It's it is. Oh, Lifetime is inherently camp. So my favorite Letterboxd review of this comes from a guy by the name of Logan, who directly says that this is a shot-for-shot remake of Clifford, but with murder. He says that Ella is Clifford, Adventure Camp is Dinosaur World, and yes. Juliet Lee is Stefan. Literally! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> it is spot-fucking-on. Absolutely. The Good Son is actually one of the greatest films ever made. Solely because the one thing Home Alone was missing was Kevin saying, don't fuck with me. Yes. <laughs> and it's owned by Fox, so it could be considered a part of the Home Alone universe. And it's way better than any of the sequels that came after, too. So there you go. <laughs> I mean, thanks to a loophole, I did watch this on Disney+. Plus. So Hell yeah. <laughs> so you can find me on the usual mission breakout on twitter and discord you can find me whenever i get off my on again off again hiatus where i will hopefully be getting back into art over on muppet vision underscore 3d i am on letterbox discord and if you're looking for other places to find me i'll be at adventure camp the greatest camp ever made you can find me on neon tales with two z's that's on youtube and on twitter uh, you can also find me going to throw up right now because I just found out they invented Coca-Cola Oreos. <laughs> yep, yeah, I actually tried those. How are they? Not that bad, actually. Oh, nice. Oh, well, then maybe I will uh, unthrow up then. I was curious how you could um, translate a soda flavor into a cookie, but I guess it, it's possible. It does smell like Coca-Cola, but once you actually try them, it's not that bad. Oh, nice. It does does have popping candy. If you don't like that, then stay away. Oh, I love popping candy. I might want that then. But but, but the weird thing is that Coca-Cola, like, soda as a drink is, like, pure sugar, essentially. So, like, would it really affect the taste of an Oreo cookie if the icing is also just pure sugar? Probably. (laughs) It's it's like sugar-flavored sugar with Pop Rocks? I I guess that's Coke. A wizard did it. All right. And as for me, you can find me on the usual spots. Tyler FG on Twitter, Tyler FG 96 on Instagram. And as for the show, you can find us on Twitter at channel underscore KRT, channel KRT podcast, all one word on Instagram. And you can also check out our discord server and our Facebook group, which you can find in the link tree in our Twitter bio. And if you want to help support us, you can check us out on Patreon where we have exclusive minisodes outtakes and episodes of this very podcast at its earliest convenience as well as our ko-fi where you can buy our exclusive mini sodas for five dollars a pop or you can just give us money whatever you want to do and of course thank you to our pals paul spicknall tony goldmark ashley hines and chris reyna for pledging to us the ten dollar level and a huge thank you to our executive producer gomer all righty funeral krt off to the rest of a spooky year yay Yay! Wooga booga! Thanks for having me. You're not going anywhere. You'll never leave me.